You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. Welcome to the Bitter Medicine Podcast, where it's all about black empowerment. Our show focuses on black news and entertainment, arts, science, economics, history, people, and strategies that uplift, empower, and motivate Africans within the diaspora. And now, your host, whose favorite color is black, Goku. Welcome back to the Bitter Medicine Podcast. I am your host, Koku. Um, today, we're going to go back to reading some journal articles. Uh, before I get into today's journal article, I just like to say that <clears throat> just just want to remind you guys that this show is a part of a podcast network, a network that we're trying to grow, by the way. Or KWAZ Radio. If you're interested in being a voice, a uh, Pan African uh, voice on the network, you know, just reach out to us. Reach out to KWAZ Radio at kwaz.radio at gmail.com. Or you can reach out to me as well. Um, you, you have the information in front of you to reach out to me. Uh, we're trying to grow this thing into a tight knit community one where we're getting the information from the diaspora out to everyone else so if you're on the continent and you want to do a show on kwaz radio reach out in the caribbean uh you're in the uk so forth and so on the other shows currently on kwaz radio that you guys should be checking out for example this is DA asking you to into the Harsh Reality Podcast, providing you with social commentary on the news affecting our community, only on KWAZ Radio. Peace, family. This is Oni, inviting you to listen to the pro-black perspective, where black problems are addressed with black solutions. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. Yes, and there's also the Queen's Council podcast. Make sure you guys tune in to all the shows on KWAZ Radio and look out for new shows coming uh, later this year. Okay, so the paper that we're reading today is called Black African Traditional Mathematics. It's by Claudia Zaslavsky. You can tell from the name what kind of person it is. But I'm a believer in knowledge. And once the knowledge is true, I don't really mind where it comes from. Uh, I like to know what's going on. And you should too as well. And I, I looked over this paper earlier um, and I thought it had some depth to it. So it made some critical points. And I think you guys will enjoy the paper. Hey, listen, if you are new to the channel, if you are new to this channel uh, right now, I'd like you to hit the like button. Uh, I'd like you to subscribe, click the bell. By clicking the bell, you'll be notified when I'm on again, when I have uh, new content uploaded. So make sure you do those three things to me right now. If you're not new here, you know the deal. Click the like button, share the videos with your neighbors, right? Let everyone know about the knowledge that's being broken down on this show, episode to episode, all right? So Black African Traditional Mathematics by Claudia Zaslavsky. I looked at her up too, and she has, she has some books on this, 
this mathematics thing from Africa, from African perspective. And, and you know, one of the things you've heard me say on the show before, and I'll repeat here, is <clears throat> these folks are studying you. And, and in fact, capitalizing off of you through their books and whatnot, and you are not studying yourself. You're not studying yourself, right? And so this forces us oftentimes to have to go to other folks to get our history. Especially when, when you're talking about the history of science or what have you, it forces us sometimes to have to go elsewhere. I did a quick YouTube search because there's something that's discussed in this paper that I found interesting that I've witnessed before and didn't realize what I was witnessing. I went to look it up to see if I could find a visual representation of it, and the only one I found was a white woman doing it. I'll tell you what, what it is when we get to it. This is no good. And a part of this curriculum work that I've been talking about, one of the things is you have to have video Mod uh, videos that accompany your modules. We have to start showing ourselves inside and outside in every aspect of whatever it is we're doing. We're talking about nation building. We want to say, illustrate, right? Give some visual of nation building. We don't need to have these other folks in the videos. We're supposed to be handling all aspects of ourselves. And so that's why, you know, it's something I want you guys to consider. As a matter of fact, speaking of the curriculum, let me, uh, let me uh, post the invite as I tend to do on the video in the comment, in the uh, chat section of, of this, uh, broadcast right so yeah so this is what i want you guys to start considering jump on the discord let's get more hands and more people to to do and and, and that's the thing like if you have a task to do it's easier for a few people to do the task and one person to do the task. That's just logic. And if you have enough people, uh, you know, who, who are thinking the right way on a task, then you, ha you will hardly have anything to do if you're one of the people, if, 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 the, if the number of people is many. You have hardly anything to do. Why not come along and join and let's get this thing done Right, let's get the numbers that we need so that you, you know, barely have to lift a finger. But that doesn't make it that the work isn't necessary. The work is quite necessary to, to do. Again, I wanna thank all, all you guys who are here with me live. I appreciate you. So, the paper starts with, the long overdue upsurge in interest in Africa has led me to investigate the development of mathematics on that continent. For many reasons, this is a very difficult task. One must look into history, ethnology, anthropology, archaeology, linguistics, and economics, and still be dissatisfied with the results, right? In the course of my investigations, I asked two young English-speaking native Africans, one from Tanzania, and the other from Kenya, how they counted in their tribal languages. They looked at me in amazement and said, quote, just as you do here in the United States. School children nowadays write Hindu Arabic numerals the world over, a truly universal language. This article is devoted mainly to a discussion of the traditional number systems and the origin of the, of the number names used by several African peoples living south of the Sahara. In the concluding section, 
I shall indicate the limitations in African mathematical development and possible avenues for further research. An investigation into the number words of a people can tell us much about the people themselves. All right? Was there a stable agricultural economy? Or were they herders or food gatherers? Did they live in a self-contained community, supplying all their own requirements and having no need for number words beyond the first few? Or were they citizens of a highly organized society requiring large numbers to develop the economy and to carry on extensive trade? What is the significance of alien number names in the language of a tribe? Did they meet the foreign people in friendship, in commerce, or through conquest? What gestures or counting objects were used? What weights and measurements and what media of exchange were employed? What significance was attached to various numbers in their religion? The researcher in African numeration encounters several difficulties. First of all, there is no organized body of knowledge on the subject. That's a shame, people. For as long as, 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 as we've been out here, we should have organized a knowledge body on subjects like you know, mathematics. And I know there's, you know there's things that are lost to time. But some of these tribes can piece together from their oral histories, you know, some of the missing history. Sorry, I had to take a drink of water there. The large number of African tribes, each having its own language, is another stumbling block. Greenberg lists the names of 730 languages, but he maintains that there are over a thousand. They can be classified into several large families, of which the largest is Bantu, spoken by most of the inhabitants of the southern half of Africa. This language relationship can be traced to the dispersal of Bantu-speaking peoples throughout this region over a period of many centuries. I found this interesting here. The word Bantu, or ba nechu ba nechu means literally the people. In addition to the language barrier, there is the problem of tribal names, variations in the names, and variations in their spelling. Tribe calls itself by a certain name, but it may have different appellations in the languages of other tribes. The Arabs or Europeans of various nations, uh, of other tribes, the Arabs or Europeans of various uh, nationalities. As for the number words themselves, <clears throat> sources of information often disagree on the names of the numbers, the origin of meaning of the names, and the spelling of the words. Frequently, the words have changed over the years. The material in this article represents merely a preliminary survey of a vast field awaiting investigation. The material in this article represents merely a preliminary survey, a vast field awaiting investigation. Who, who do we think needs to become the investigators in this vast field? And again, this is why the education is so important. You will educate your people to continue to work here to be the, the, the principal investigators in this field. Right now, the education you're getting in the public, as they say, public school system, is to get you just to go and continue to work for these other people, not yourselves. And so that's why the curriculum is so important. It also teaches the learners when you finish your education, which is, which, which is never really done, right? You never finish learning once you're alive, right? But once you finish uh, this, uh, what do they call, uh, 
for lack of a better word, is grade school education. Your next step is to start filling the roles in these various fields and expanding the knowledge base. Your next step is to not only expand the knowledge base, but use that knowledge to solve the problems in the community. Problem of your nation. To continue. This brings us to a section called the earliest mathematical artifact. One of the earliest artifacts indicating an involvement with counting was found a few years ago at Aishango on the shore of Lake Edward in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. They need to change those names from Lake Edward and Lake Victoria and stuff too. It is a bone tool handle with notches arranged in definite patterns and a bit of quartz fixed in a narrow cavity on its head. It dates back to the period between 9,000 BC, for all you Christian ass folks, and 6,500 BC. 9,000 BC, so how can the world have been created, you know, 2,000 or, no, no, sorry, 6,000 years ago. The discoverer of the artifact, Jean de Heinzelin, suggests the following, quote, it may have been used for engraving or tattooing or even for writing of some kind. Even more interesting, however, are its markings, group of notches arranged in three distinct columns. The pattern of these notches leads me to suspect that they represent more than pure decoration. When one counts them, a series of number sequences emerge. In one of the columns, they are arranged in four groups composed of 11, 13, 17, and 19 individual notches. In the next, they are arranged in eight groups containing three, six, four, eight, 10, five, five, and seven notches. In the third, they are arranged in four groups of 11, 21, 19, and nine. I find it difficult to believe that these sequences are nothing more than a random selection of numbers. The groupings in each column are quite different from one another, and each column contains internal relationships unlike those found in either of the others. Take, take the first column, for example. Take the first column, for example. Um, 11, 13, 17, and 19 are all prime numbers in ascending order, and they are the only prime numbers between 10 and 20. Or consider the third, 11, 21, 19, and nine represent the digits of 10 plus one, 20 plus one, 20 minus one, and 10 minus one. The middle column shows a less cohesive set of relations. Nevertheless, it too follows a pattern of a sort. The groups of three and six notches are fairly close together. Then there is a space after which the four and eight appear also close together. Then again, after a space comes a 10, after which are the two fives quite close. This arrangement strongly suggests appreciation of the concept of duplication or multiplication by two. It is of course possible that all the patterns are fortuitous, but it seems probable that they were deliberately planned. If so, they may represent an, arithme uh, an arithmetical game of some sort devised by a people who had a number system based on 10 as well as a knowledge of duplication and of prime numbers. There is a difference of opinion about the markings on the bone, Alexander. Oh, sorry. There is a difference of opinion about the markings on the bone. Alexander Marshak, who has examined the markings on, artif on the artifact by microscope says, it represents a notational and counting system serving to accumulate groups of marks made by different points and apparently engraved at different times. 
analysis of the microscopic data shows no indication of accounting by fives and tens, but that the group uh, groups of marks vary irregularly in amount. That is, an early system of notational counting is clear. However, this does not necessarily imply a modern arithmetic numerical system. I have tracked the origins of such early notational systems back to the upper Paleolithic cultures of about 30,000 BC. I see some activity in the chat room. I see the pro-black perspective is in the room. Peace to you, brother. And I see KW Don 7 is here as usual. Peace to you too. The pro-black perspective says Robin Walker has a book on African mathematics. Okay, that's good to know. But, but while that might be the case, like I said, I went to look up something on YouTube to, to be able to show a visual reference on the show. And I could not find one with African folks of any kind, right? Showing um, this concept. That has to change. We have to change that stuff. And we have to constantly be updating these works too, right? Adding new information when there's new information or new discoveries, etc. Uh, KW Don 7 says a 6,000 year timeline is the beginning of Urugu. It is their benchmark. I, I, I agree with that too. Right? But we got a lot of our people going along with that benchmark. It's just silly. So this brings us to, uh, and uh, by the way, uh, only from the pro-black perspective. You, if you don't mind, if you know the if you know the title of the book from Robin Walker, can you drop that in the chat, please? And I'll read it off on, uh, live on air. If you could just drop that in, that I, I I can't look it up right now myself. History has shown recent. History has shown that I might even have the book and not realize that it was a Robin Walker book. So, as was the case with the Carter G. Woodson book on um, African myths and folk tales. Because this is just a, this is just a side note. So I talked about this book, African myths and folk tales, right, on my show a few episodes back not realizing that the book was a Carter G. Woodson book. And you know what's the thing that kind of threw me off when I look back on it now? The book is, is, is said to be authored by Carter Godwin Woodson, right? Like they put his full name and just that can throw, you know, someone off, believe it or not. Uh, you know, on, on, unless you know that person by that full name, that can throw you off. So maybe I have the Robin Walker book in some form, PDF or physical, and I never realized uh, it was uh, by him, etc. So to continue, we are in a section called Development of Number Systems. The development of a number system depends on the need. In a small self-contained economy, typical of large sections of Africa, in which all or most of the necessities of life are produced within the community, there is little need for an extensive reckoning system. The names of numbers are frequently connected with the objects to be counted, just as we have special names for certain sets, flock, herd, brace, etc., dating back from a pastoral or agricultural society. Finger and other body gestures might accompany or replace spoken words. Gesture counting is especially necessary in the marketplace, where people speaking various languages gather to exchange goods. It might be customary to use beads, shells, nuts, or pebbles. The word calculate is derived from calculus, Latin for pebble. As media or exchange or counting, material, uh, counting ma materials and to arrange them in sets, thus giving rise to special words. On the other hand, many African societies require the use of large numbers for their well-developed economies. 
most Americans and Europeans are just beginning to learn of the great empires that have existed in various parts of Africa. Since ancient Egypt, uh, there's Kush with his iron-working city Moro, flourished just south of Egypt before the Christian era. In the western part of the Sudan region, there were ancient Ghana, which did an extensive trade in gold. The cities of Timbuktu and Dijene, centers of advanced learning, the kingdoms of Mali, Songhai, and Kanem, to name a few. Further south lie the extensive ruins of Zimbabwe in present Rhodesia. Early in the Christian era, this area was a source of gold, copper, tin, and iron, particularly for the Eastern world. The kingdoms of Kitwara and Congo, of Nubia and ancient Ethiopia, were highly developed many centuries ago. Cattle herding, the occupation of people such as the Maasai of Kenya and the Hottentots of South Africa required extensive systems of numeration, as did the large-scale trade carried on by the advanced ancient societies. A number system that does nicely for the immediate needs of the tribe may be inadequate for trading with Arab or European merchants or those of other societies. So we find the Arabic word alif, the first letter of the alphabet, used for 1,000 in some, Su in some Sudanic languages. And in modern Mende, 100 is hondo from the English. Words of uh, alien tribes enter a language because of widespread shifting of populations the conquest of one people by another, or trade. To quote Mijian, published in 1911, quote, this war of the numeral system is the sole historical record left by antiquity of raids, wars, and of much misery to the human race. The numerals are the historians of those bygone conflicts, and who can say the price in blood of one strange word a particle found in a language. I see there's more activity in the chat room. Uh, yes. Uh, KW Dawn 7. Okay, he, he came through. He said African mathematics, history textbooks, and classroom lessons by Robin Walker and John, Math and John Matthews in the Pro Black Perspective said, yeah, that's it. So that's a book I have to look through my PDF. That, Cause that's the thing I have like literally easy a thousand books in PDF form. And I need to get them on the discord. And I have been so busy, I, I just haven't gotten to it. And I might very well have that book. So that's something I have to look up and begin to, to study. So that brings us to this. Uh, so uh, again, thanks KW Don Seven and Oni for bringing up that book and uh, coming through with the title for us. All right. And if you're a listener, if you're listening to this episode live on playback, and you've uh, you've 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 connected with that with that book, you know. Drop a comment, let us know what, what your thoughts were on the on that book. So systems based on five and twenty. This is another section of the of the paper. Systems based on five and twenty. The names of numbers in many languages give clear evidence of finger counting, and in some cases of toe counting. The word for five frequently is the same as the word hand. Six is hand and one, then hand and two, and so forth, to ten, which may be an independent word or may be two hands. Ten is followed by ten plus one, and so on to fifteen, which may be two hands plus one hand, or ten plus one hand, or even an independent word as in the language of the Diola tribe of Portuguese Guinea, where the word means to bow. Continue by adding one, two, etc., to the word for 15 until we reach 20. This word in some languages means literally man complete. In the Banda language of Central Africa, the word for 15 means three fists, and for 20, 
take one person. The same method is then used all over again, adding to the word for 20 to form the numerals for 21 to 39. 40 is expressed as two men complete, and 100 is five men complete. In other words, all of the digits on the hands and feet have been counted five times. This is the basic form of a quin decimal system, meaning based on five and 20, in which five is the primary base. It's found in many languages of the Sudan region of West Africa, Igbo and Ibobio of Nigeria, the Diola, Balanti, uh, Nalu, the Banhun of Portuguese Guinea, the Ve and Kru of Liberia as well as the Nubia tribe of the Eastern Sudanic region. Other tribes also use the Quinn Quavivesimal system, but with, but with interesting variations. For example, take the formation of the words for six and seven in the related languages of Mandingo and Mendi, right? So here we look at these for those of you who are just listening, we have these three columns. One column has the, the English words for one, two, one, two, five, six, seven. Second column has the Mandingo corresponding words for those uh, first words, and then the Mandy corresponding words. So for one in Mandingo, it's killing. In Mandy, it's Yera or Ita. For two in Mandingo, it's Fila. In Mendi, it's fella, of 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 feel it, right? Um, if I have any one in the chat room who who knows the languages and the pronunciations, by all means, correct me, as I'm sure I, I probably might be butchering some of the words. For five in Mandingo is Lulu, and in Mende is Lalu. For six in Mandingo is Waro. In Mendi is Woita. For seven, in Mandingo is Woro Willa. And in Mendi is Wofella. Okay? So you see there's some, um, you know. So, so to continue, my first reaction due to my ignorance of the language was that the word for seven is composed of the words for six and two. Seven equals six plus two. Right, according to these words. But a bit of sleuthing revealed that waro means add one, an abbreviated form of add one to five. Similarly, waito, sorry, waita is an abbreviation of, of add one, while waro, willa, and wofella mean add two to five. Both the Mendi and the Mandingo systems are based on five and use the term for person or man complete to represent 20. However, in Mandingo, 30 is 10 times three, 40 is 10 times four, etc. Possibly because of Arabic influence, uh, the secondary base is 10 rather than 20. This is true also of the Fulani of Nigeria. Remarkably, uh, Kononto, the Mandingo word for nine, means literally to the one of the belly, a reference of the nine months of pregnancy. The Mandingo kingdom of Mali was in the 14th century one of the largest imperial domains in the world. However, their present system of numeration may not be so old. I was, I was unable to trace its age. This brings us to a section called linguistic change. The number words of a language may not be the same in sources from different periods. Mijiod uh, states that the Mende tribe says five men finished for 100. But a recent instruction book on the Mende language gives Hondo Yila 
The word hondo is derived from the English hundred and yila means one. A similar development has taken place in Hausa, a language widely spoken in Northern Nigeria and the native tongue of 14 million people in 1968. Hausa states were already in existence in the 11th century. 19th century authors classified the Hausa numerical system as quaternary vegesimal, but with 12 as a base for the formation of the words for 13 through 18. Later sources showed a clear relationship to the denarii, Arabic system with respect to the numerals starting with 20, as well as the use of the Arabic word for six. An interesting aspect of the Hausa method of numeration is the use of subtraction principle for compound numbers ending in eight or nine on the part of some Eastern Hausa tribes. For example, 18 equals 20 minus two, and 19 equals 20 minus one. However, a recently published Hausa grammar uh, gives a system of numeration that is pure denari. That's the thing, man. You gotta, you gotta protect. I like, you know, I, I suggested in this writing uh, through trade, uh, uh, you know, not just through conquest, sometimes through trade as well. But you can lose yourself if you allow, if you, if you always allow yourself to be the subordinate partner, right? You lose yourself. You can see that in relationships too. If you're a man, for example, and you allow yourself to be always the subordinate partner, you will lose yourself. You will become unrecognizable eventually. And it seems like in a lot of these transactions, I'm not talking about conquest, we understand that. But just like transactionally, it seems like Africans a lot of times took the lower road. And so they took on some of these other people's words and stuff like that. And, you know, after some time, you wouldn't really recognize yourself. But to continue, uh, Mijiad reported three designations for 20 in use at the same time. Um, Ha'ia, a special word applied to 20 cowrie shells, which were used as currency, or two, the plural for the word for 10, and three, the Arabic word for 20. In fact, one of the house of dialects had a special word for a bag of 20,000 Kari shells. These are the house of number words in current use. So for in, in for, so at the time of this writing, the current house of uh, number words were one was Dea, two Bia, three Uku, four Hudu, five Bayar, six Shida, which comes from the Arabs, seven bakwe eight takwas uh yeah takwas nine tara ten goma 19 goma sha lara 20 ashirin from arabic 30 talatin from arabic and 100 dara or, 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 or dari So that brings us to this section of the paper called the Subtraction Principle. Many black people of the Americas can trace their ancestry to the Yoruba-speaking peoples whose cultures dating back seven centuries have only recently come to light. They live in the area that is now southwestern Nigeria. The Yoruba language is now a lingua franca of West Africa and is the native tongue of 10 million people. Yoruba numeration illustrates an unusual subtraction principle still in effect today. My first source is a book published in 1894 by a colonial officer who refers to the quote, slave coast of West Africa. The number names are as follows. One, any or Okan. Two, Eji. Uh, three, Ita, four, 
Aaron, five, Aaron, six, Ifa, seven, Eje, eight, Ejo. I'm sure I'm messing up that J sound. Uh, nine, Isan, ten, Iwa, from which means to come together, referring to the two hands. So when you put your two hands together, they call that Iwa, and that represents ten. The numbers from 11 to 14 were formed by addition to 10, the word for which was changed from Iwa to La. 14 is Erin La. The numbers from 15 to 19 were formed by subtraction from 20. 16 is Erin D. Logan, four less than 20. The multiples of 20 were formed as follows. 40 is Ogun. Eji, 20 times 2, contracted to Oji. The odd multiples of 10 were built on the subtraction principle. 70 is Iwa D Ogorin, 10 less than 20 times 4, and abbreviated to Adarin. The multiples of 10, therefore, were so 20 is Ogun, which is interesting, 30 is Ogbon. 40 is, is Ogoji or Oji, 50 is Odata, 60 is Ogota, 70 is Adorin, 80 is Ogorin, 90 is Adorun, 100 is Ogorun, which is 20 times 5, and then 200 is Igba. Numbers between those given above were composed on the addition or subtraction principle, similar to the numbers from 11 to 19. The Yoruba do not count by hundreds. Above 200, they use the nomenclature of Kari shell reckoning, the common currency. The book I used as a reference for modern Yoruba was written by an African chief, published in 1963, and designed to enable the foreign visitor to engage in conversation with Yoruba-speaking people. Interesting. I'll have to look in the reference section to f find out who wrote the book. I was surprised to find that the system of enumeration had not changed. Right? The system of, of, of enumeration had not changed. There was one exception. Besides expressing 100 as Ogorun, the expression Ogo Khan is used. Khan equals one. The subtraction principle is still employed in relation to money. The word for 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 for, for truppence is toro. Two shillings and three pence equals uh, M Edgy the toro. Two shillings and nine pence equals M eta din toro, three less, three pence. So, you know what I'm getting from this? And if you guys have, have had experience with the Robin Walker book, uh, you guys let me know. But what, what I'm getting from this is that, look, if you come from people, who practice math in this way. And remember, there's this concept of genetic memories, except, right? If you come from a people that practice math in this way, do you think you can really grasp the math as it's taught from Europeans? See, that's a serious question. It, it's not that you're incapable of learning it their way. Of course, we're capable. We've been doing it now for so long. But the question I'm, I'm, I'm really trying to get to, and maybe you guys who are listening live can, can drop your thoughts on it, is, but if your people for, for centuries were dealing with numbers in this way, in the way that I've been reading, right? Can you really be all you should be or all you can be in the mathematics that is taught the European way. Drop your comments, I'll read them live on the air if you uh if you comment.
Uh, this brings us to a section called gesture counting. Uh, before I read that section, uh, let me just drop station ID. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. This is DA asking you to tune into the Harsh Reality Podcast, providing you with social commentary on the news affecting our community, only on KWAZ Radio. Peace, family. This is Oni, inviting you to listen to the pro-black perspective, where black problems are addressed with black solutions. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. All right, and we're back. Uh, make sure you guys check out those other shows on KWAZ Radio. All right. Uh, no comments yet, but I'll continue. Um, it's all good. So we had this part of the paper called gesture counting. Now, I've seen gesture counting in the past. Uh... In fact, I've seen the gesture counting that I think is described here in this paper. I've seen it like in the Caribbean from older folks, you know, many years ago when I was a child. And I went to look on YouTube for this gesture counting, you know, African gesture counting, and couldn't find not one video with Africans doing the counting. Maybe I didn't go you know, scroll down far enough, but I did, I couldn't find it. Maybe I didn't put the right keywords in, but I couldn't find, I did find one where there's a white woman doing gesture count. And of course, I didn't want to show that because I want our people seeing our people explaining and doing stuff more than anything, right? I, I, I have, I'm a person, I believe visuals are supremely important, right? But anyway, let's continue this reading. As we have seen, many number systems develop from finger or gesture count. However, we must not commit the error of identifying such a development with a primitive way of life. Some of our English number words originated in this way. 11 means one left, an abbreviation of 10 and one left over. While 12 is literally two left. No doubt the terminology refers to the additional fingers needed after having used all 10 digits on both hands. Yet in spite of its primitive origins, this numeration is used for space travel calculations. Space travel calculations. The following is a description of the gestures used by the Dabita people of Kenya when counting cattle or other commodities. Maybe I should have looked up Kenya specifically, right? So here, here's, here's how they do the count. No digestion for eight. We shall have more on that later. And I, and I thought this was interesting. And again, I've seen this before. You know, I had forgotten about it. And I remember now I could remember thinking, wow, that's strange how she counted that, right? So it's for one, you put the right hand and put up the forefinger, that's one. Two is the right hand, first two fingers. Three is the right hand, three fingers. Four is the right hand, four fingers. Five is a closed fist. And I saw that as a kid and I was puzzled. But five is a closed fist. Six is the right fist, left thumb. Seven is the right fist, left thumb and forefinger. Eight, uh, you know, uh, eight fingers and no thumbs. Nine is where you hold the left fingers in the right hand. You clasp the left fingers in the right hand. So that's the five from, from the left hand, as well as uh, the four that you're clasping, right? And then 10 is both fists. So if I hit you with a 10 piece, you know what I just did, right? If 
But I saw, I swear to you, I saw this as a kid from an older woman and I couldn't understand it at the time. And that shows you, you know, that's just a small gesture of showing you where you come from and how these things can be passed down. The gestures accompanied the appropriate words for the numbers. The word for 20 was related to the human body. 40 was, done, well, was denoted by two bodies. The children of the tribe played a game in which they used finger gestures accompanied by an entirely different set of number words. It was said that the words had been in use a century before. There are many vestiges of finger counting on one hand and then on the other combined with a denarii system. The rules for finger counting were well established by many peoples. The Hororo tribe of Bantu origin living in Southwest Africa used the following procedure. And before I say the procedure again, wouldn't it be cool for to, our children to learn these systems, right? It should resonate with them better than the systems that they currently learn. The number from one to four were indicated by laying the appropriate number of fingers of the left hand on the right thumb. The left hand to the mouth meant five. The gesture for the number six to nine consisted in laying the appropriate number of fingers of the right hand on the left thumb, starting with the small finger. The, v uh, the, the Viennese writer, Marianne Schmidt, gives descriptions of several elaborate methods of counting by gestures. In the Zulu language of South Africa, also of Bantu origin, the word for six means literally, take a thumb. The Zulu system is another example of the use of subtraction principle. The following ex explanation, and again, I ask that question, is subtraction principle more or less, you know, better for our children? The following explanation of the origin of the names of the numbers in the Zulu language was given by a missionary, a missionary, to South Africa. One is uh, Nai, means state of being alone. Two is Bili, which means raise a separate finger. Three is Tatu, means to take. Ni is unexplained, that's four. Five is Halanu, which means all the fingers united. Six is Tati Silupu, Tati Silupu, Silupa, which means take the right thumb. Seven is Icombile, means point with foreigner of right hand, with four, oh, sorry, forefinger of right hand. Eight is Shire in Galombili, which means leave out two fingers. Nine is Shire uh, in Galolongi, which means leave out one finger. Ten is Shumi, which means cause to stand. I mean, by the way, learning these numbers like this, right? I talked about this when I read those African myths and stories, right? Those folk tales and stuff. Because of how the book sets up the folk tales, where they tell you this folk tale is from the Zulu people, for example. This is a prime example of learning how to count numbers in the Zulu language. So you read the story, you learn about the animals that the Zulu people interacted with or formed stories around, so then you study those animals. And I, I, as I mentioned, you then use that, uh, that story as the basis of learning certain simple words in the language. So here you would learn the 10, you know, how, how to count to 10, the words for, the, for, for counting to 10 in the Zulu language. How, how dope is that, right? And then you could replicate this for different tribes of people. Hottentots, Hausa, etc. You include words like, hello, how are you? My name is, like simple stuff. And, and you could do this with young, like kids in grade one, to be honest. So anyway, that brings us to the next uh, section, systems based on five and 10. 
the Wolofs, Fulani, Soninke, and other tribes of the Western Sudan area adopted the Quinari Denari system, as did the Capelli tribe of Liberia. An excellent booklet on the education of children of the Capelli tribe in the field of mathematics describes the number system of the native people. Its primary base is five, and the secondary base is 10. 20 is expressed as two tens. Some words are closely related to Mandingo. Most, uh, most arithmetic operations are performed with the aid of piles of stones, and the people become extremely adept in recognizing numbers in this way. In fact, in an experiment requiring estimation, and this was interesting, by the way, in, a, in fact, in an experiment requiring estimation of the number of stones and piles of various sizes, Capelli illiterate adults, illiterate adults, achieved far better scores than did the Yale undergraduate, un, undergraduate students, right? So these African folks can look at a pile of stones and give you a closer estimate than some Yale students, right? And Yale is supposed to be a big thing amongst these, uh, these white folks. Uh, they also excel in estimating the amounts of rice in containers. The activity of measuring rice was an integral part of their lives. However, the Capelli subjects did poorly when asked about the number of people or houses in their village. Variations within a system is the next section. Among the Bantu peoples who inhabit most of the southern half of Africa, the Denari system is generally used combined with several special forms which may have originated in finger counting or in taboos. I've already mentioned the Zulu word for six, meaning take a thumb. Some Bantu and Sudanic languages use words meaning three and three for six, four and three for seven, four and four for eight, and five and four for nine. Particularly common in the Bantu languages is a word similar to nana for eight, from the stem na, meaning four. Huh. The origin of this compounding of words lies in the method of finger reckoning called representation by two equal or quasi-equal semantics. That's a mouthful to say. Uh, or Neo to counting. The finger gestures are as follows. For six, you have three. For seven, you have four fingers of one hand and three of the other, and eight, you have four fingers of each hand. A good, a good example is the Ikoi language of the Cameroons. The number three is Essa, four is Eni, five is Elon, six is Essa, Esaressa, seven is Inaressa, eight is Inareni, and nine is Iloneni. Jesus, say that fast, right? This variation is widespread east of Lake Tanganyika through the, through the Congo River area and in Sudan and, and, and in the Western Sudan. In one of the Diola languages of, of the Senegal, uh, Six equals five plus one, seven is four plus three, eight is four plus four, and nine is five plus four. Evidence of this principle is found in the word for eight in Swahili, a Bantu language influenced by Arabic and spoken by 12 million people on the East Coast. Since many students in the United States are interested in Swahili, I shall give the words for the numbers. The hyphen indicates the word is a stem. So for the, so in Swahili, the number one is hyphen. So, 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 so most of these words are hyphenated. So it's hyphen moja, two is hyphen mbili, three is hyphen tatu, four is hyphen enni, five is hyphen tano, six is sita from Arabic, seven is saba from Arabic, eight is hyphen nani, which is four and four, right? 
uh, nine is Tissa from Arabic, 10 is Kumi, and 20 is Ishirini, right? Again, you get, you get an, an education in Swahili words for these numbers. So this brings us to uh, a section called number taboos. Again, if you're new here, uh, please uh, give the video a thumbs up. I think it's uh, good information. I think it connects a lot of concepts that we've been talking about for a while now in these live streams. Uh, make sure to give a thumbs up and share the knowledge, right? It's a good video. Share the knowledge with people around. So we had number taboos, an interesting phenomenon. It's a compounding of the names for seven, eight, or nine. Seven equals six plus one, nine equals eight plus one. As among the man, mandiacos of the Western Sudan. While in the Ga language of the Ivory Coast, Lagoon, seven equals six plus one, and eight equals six plus two. This phenomenon may have been due to a taboo on speaking the names of certain numbers. Seven is a particularly ominous number among the Congo and the Maasai. The strange example I have found of a compound name for a number occurs in Umbundu, Umbundu, a language spoken in Portuguese Angola. The name for seven literally means six, two, which is eight actually. I was fortunate in being able to discuss this matter with a missionary, Mr. Lawrence Henderson, who had spent many years in Angola. He told me that he, he had it from uh, an Umbundu-speaking person who in turn had been told by an older person, one who had had no contact with anthropologists, that the original word for seven was subject to a taboo. Therefore, the word for eight had slipped into its place. The, ta the taboo may be handled in another manner. The speaker merely makes a gesture for the, f for the forbidden number, while the listener says the word. In that way, the danger is divided between them. Many tribes believe it is unlucky to count people, domestic animals, or valuable possessions for fear that harm may befall them. Remember when we were talking just a, a couple of paragraphs back, we were talking about that study they did versus those Africans um, versus the, the, the Capelli people versus the Yale undergraduates who they could tell you pretty closely how much rice is in a container, right? Or how much stones are in a heap. But when asked about the number of people, they they kind of didn't do well with that. Well, perhaps it was, it was this taboo type of thing going on, right? Uh, in experiments with the Capelli people, oh yeah, just talked about it. In experiments with the Capelli people of Liberia, the very same illiterate adults who surpassed Yale students in estimating the number of stones in piles of various sizes were vague when asked how many people or how many houses there were in their village. The authors mentioned the reluctance of the people to count living creatures aloud, but apparently did not realize that fear might lie at the root of the incorrect replies to their questions about the number of people or houses. Each number taboos, uh, such number taboos are not found only in Africa. The Old Testament relates a taboo on counting people similar to the Capellas. The ancient Hebrew also had a taboo on the writing of the numerals for 15 and 16. The Hebrew number symbols resemble the Greek in that the letters of the alphabet represented the numerals. Since the, since the Hebrews used a denarii system, 15 normally would be represented by Y-O-D. The letter for 10 followed by H-E-H. -H. The letter for 5 followed with the letter for 10 Follow okay, so YOD, right? The letter for 10, followed by HEH, -E the letter for 5. However, this combination, as well as that for 10 plus 6, would spell the forbidden name of Jehovah. Therefore, the combination 9 plus 6 was substituted for 10 plus 5, and 9 plus 7 for 10 plus 6 in written Hebrew. 
for subsequent numerals, the appropriate digit was added to 10. And how many buildings in the United States skipped 13 in numbering the floors? Huh. That's interesting. So this brings us to a section called Other Bases. I have discussed the principal methods for number building in Africa. The quantity system with either of uh, a, a vegesimal or denarii secondary base. The mathematical operations for addition, subtraction, and multiplication upon the basic numbers give rise to the larger ones. Uh, five was not the only base. There's evidence of the use of six as a base in some tribes of the Sudan. For example, the Bulandi, Bolan, Buraman, uh, possibly the Ga, in which seven equals six plus one, and eight equals six plus two. The Brahms and the Mankanye, in which 12 equals six times two, an otherwise quaternary system. In parts of the Igbo-speaking area of Nigeria, six Kari shells constituted a unit. A 19th century source mentioned Hausa as a language in which numbers 13 to 18 were related to 12, but later versions of the counting system did not bear this out. The pygmies, properly called Ba Mbuti, were said to have used a binary base, and binary influence is evident in many other systems. This topic is discussed in great detail by Schmidt. There are some relics of base four, as well as very mixed systems of numeration. The Messiah and the Hausa were said to use 60 as a secondary base. The Congo people counted beads by 50s, while 40 was an important number to the Iwe and Igbo tribes. In several languages of the Mandingo family, 30 was expressed as 215s. Frequently, measures of units of currency influence the number system. We have already noted the relationship of Kari shell currency to the house of number words. Among the Bangai people of the Congo region, the brass rod currency, consisting of one rod twisted around other rods to complete a bundle, gave rise to many numerical stems. We see in European languages many vestiges of bases other than the Nari. Score, the French quatre vinched, uh, which is four twenties for 80, 12 for the number of units in a foot or a dozen, 60 in time and angle measurements, and other similar instruments of torture for teachers and students, all remnants from technically more primitive forms of society. This brings us to a section called Number Sense. Let me take a sip of water here. Oh, yeah. Comprehension of numerical ideas is manifested not only in the explicit use of numbers, but also in an intuitive feeling for numerical relations. Such a highly developed number sense is needed to play quote, the world's oldest game, a board game traditional in most parts of Africa for many centuries. It is called Omweso in the Luganda language of Uganda, Emba in Angola, Bankala in Egypt, Mongola on the upper Congo River, Adi in Ghana, and Count and Capture, to summarize the game in English. The game is played with seeds or pebbles on a beautifully carved board having at least 12 bowl-like depression. So this is a game on color. And there's a paper I had, I was gonna illustrate something uh, in, a, in, a, in an episode, I was gonna do it late last year, actually. Uh, I was gonna illustrate African mathematics in the game on color. I never got around to doing it. Uh, I also, and I mentioned this on the show, on the on the Discord, which is really for game streaming and stuff like that, I actually really wanted to stream the Mancala board game. Uh, and I want 
you know, folks to, to be able to, you know, hop on and play it and have fun too. I think it's something that we should own in every household. I know I own my own Mancala board and the stones and everything, right? This is something that we should be playing. Uh, in the chat room, I see some activity has shown up. Uh, KW Dawn 7 says, Hebrew is Greek by Joseph Yuhada is unavailable on Amazon. And when it was available, it was priced off the charts by third party sellers. I, I believe you. I believe you. I talked about this a little while ago. I mean, only to say from the pro-black perspective, talked about this with the Carlos Cook's book, which was literally behind a high $900. You might as well say it was behind a $1,000 paywall, right, on Amazon. When I did the episode about the, the boy who harnessed the wind, in that film, um, and in one of his, one of his TED, like talks uh william the, the 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 boy in question uh he claimed he mentioned that he used a book i think the book was called using energy right that's the book he studied when you go on amazon and look up that book it, when it's available it's there for like three four hundred dollars right a lot of times they put this knowledge behind these these high paywalls so that you can get access to it uh, but that book i'm going to look it up and see if i could find that on the uh on the torrents um kw dawn seven what what about that book in particular do you think stands out what about that book in particular do you think stands out? Just hit me, hit me a little, a little summary of it in the uh, chat. Uh, for lack of, um, to continue, for lack of a board, it may be played on the ground or on a rock. We're talking about the Mancala game. There are several versions, but all require that the players can head, uh, there are several versions, but all require that the players plan ahead I move very quickly. A move may consist of several circuits of the player's board, and at each circuit, the number of marbles in their respective holes varies. In considering the various moves possible to him, and in assessing their respective merits, a player also has to look several circuits ahead, and has to bear in mind the changes in disposition with his board will, will constantly undergo. Yet a good player can do this almost instantaneous and there's little pause for consideration between moves. So that's like, that's an important thing to say about this, this game, Mancala. If you're familiar with the game, you probably play it on an app on your phone or something like that. And a lot of times, you know, like the app version of these, of this game will tell you how much stones you have in your pit. And so it's, you, you don't even have to think about it or anything. You just say, okay, well, it's five stones. I need in this particular pit, let me pull these stones and drop them around the board in a counterclockwise way. But in my research for the episode I wanted to do, I was going to break down the mathematics of Mancala, which I might still go ahead and do as a matter of fact. Um, what I... What I came to learn was that in Africa, when these guys are playing this game, these folks are playing this game, they're not taking time to count how much seeds they have in their pot. It's like rapid fire. I'm talking, you grab the seeds, you drop them, he grabs the seeds, he drops, and you're, you're thinking strategy while you're doing this. Uh, and the, the point I'm getting at is, it's a, tra it's a tradition of quick estimations, quick math, quick calculation. Imagine getting that learning from a young age and being able to build upon that learning from a young age. We wouldn't have so much problems with mathematics out here in this part of the world if we really stuck to the mathematics 
of what we knew, right? So now that last point, yet a good player can do this almost instantaneously. And there's little pause for consideration between moves. That's a lot of things happening. The, the sentences before that last sentence tell you all these things that are happening. You're trying to capture the, the seeds um, in your opponent's pit. And you got to be able to know, like the Capelli people were able to look at uh, a pile of rocks and, and, and estimate with some accuracy how many rocks are in that pile. You're supposed to be able to do that. To, to be to be really good at the game, you're supposed to be able to do that. Now they dumb it down out here on the apps, etc. Even in the board games, you have time to kind of count how much, you know, how many seeds you have. I'm putting forward like, yo, this this game on Kala needs to be taught to our children early. And the idea of being able to look and estimate the numbers and make those calculations and strategize almost instantaneously, that's what needs to be promoted amongst our kids. Uh, if you guys have a Mancala board game or have played, you know, played the app or whatever, drop a comment saying that, yeah, I'm, I'm familiar with the game. To continue, I played the game with a friend who had learned it from the descendants of ex-slaves in Suriname, South America. She said it is considered imp improper to count. One is expected to see at a glance how many seeds are in each hole, although there may be 10 or more, and to plan this move accordingly. Right? Our ancestors, right? Our elders had this, had this almost machine-like mind in a sense. But us messing with these folks in the education system have dumbed us down. And then they want to say, they want to act like they're smarter than us. The fantastic accomplishments of the African drummer depend upon a highly developed number sense. Although I found no material about formal work with fractions, the expression for two thirds is equivalent in many regions to divide it into three pieces and take two. The African drummer must be extremely adept at dividing a beat or a musical phrase. The leader announces the theme on his drum and the other drummers elaborate upon it, each playing a different rhythm. Africans develop the ability to hear the various rhythms and the dancer expresses each rhythm with a different part of his body simultaneously. Again, this is, these people are, uh, these people are capitalizing off of research and RP. You know, mathematical developments in the context of history. So this is the next section that we're at. I asked KW Don Seven that question. He says, it destroys the Judaic, no, uh, sorry, it destroys the Judaic narrative. It proved linguistically that Hebrew comes out of, out of Greek. Okay. Okay. Thanks for, thanks for that feedback, KW Don Seven. And again, the point KW Don Seven was making was that book that that destroys that idea is behind a paywall. Right? That's priced off the charts, as KW Don 7 put it. If you don't understand the importance of books, go on Amazon and start looking up certain texts. And you'll see they put certain things behind these huge paywalls. That tells you the importance of books, my friend. Right? But, uh, so this section, Mathematical Developments in the Context of History. A thorough, exam a thorough investigation of the development of mathematics in Africa outside of ancient Egypt has yet to be done. Certainly there, and that's what I was saying, we need more people getting into these areas, right? Uh, certainly there's evidence that mathematics was used in the complex, highly organized societies that existed during the past 3,000 years. 
Along the great rivers and lakes of Africa, there, are, there arose stable societies based on agriculture and requiring, therefore, the evolution of a calendar and the development of systems of weights and measurements. That the societies of antiquity became technically advanced is demonstrated by the ancient practice of hillside terrace, uh, terracing still found in Ethiopia and in the remains of ancient cultures to the south. No mean engineering feat. No mere, I guess, engineering feat. We do not know to what extent the builders of the pyramids and temples of Kush were familiar with geometry. The key to the written script of this kingdom, which reaches glory during the millennium before the Christian era, has not yet been discovered. Geometry must have been used, too, in constructing the elliptical temple and the other colossal stone buildings of Zimbabwe in Southeast Africa, perhaps a thousand years ago. Extensive trade united the states of Africa with one another and with the rest of the world, necessitating the use of weights, measures, and media of exchange. Soon after 800 AD, the state of Ghana in the Western Sudan region was named the Land of Gold. The kings of Ghana developed a complex system for exacting tribute from merchants who entered the country to trade in gold, salt, copper, and other commodities. Later, other empires developed along the Niger and Benue rivers in Central and Western Sudanic Africa, Kanem, Bornu, Songhai, and Mali, whose major city was the fabulous Timbuktu. Travelers and historians wrote of their great wealth, high level of organization, and far-reaching commerce. In East Africa, archaeologists have found beads from India, porcelain from China, and swords from Damascus. While writers as far back as the first century AD told of the ivory, gold, skins, and iron that Africa sent eastward. Archaeological research has barely begun in most parts of Africa. Old documents lie untranslated or unpublished, and in some cultures, oral tradition is the only history. Some of the most important archaeological sites were destroyed by Europeans in their search for loot. Much has been discovered in the past few years, and no doubt much more will soon come to light. However, some writers have concluded, on the basis of the available records, that in the 15th century, the level of culture among the masses of black people in West Africa was higher than that of Northern Europe during the same period. Why then do we not see in Africa the spurt in mathematical development that took place in Europe during the last five centuries? There are several reasons and they can be surmised as the geography of the continent and the destruction of African societies by invasion, the slave trade, and the scramble for Africa. The geography of much of Africa, high mountains, arid desert, rainforests, make it an inhospitable continent, discouraging to the growth of stable agricultural and urban communities. So, you know, you, this is where you get a little propaganda in here now, right? Since the continent has been relatively sparsely populated, whole tribes frequently migrated long distances to find better lands. Africa has a long history of population dispersal. From the 11th century onward, Africa was the scene of Muslim holy wars and wars for wealth, while Western Europe was free to develop unmolested. By the 15th century, the European slave trade was in full swing, but it was not to reach its peak until three centuries later to satisfy the needs of the New World. Its destructive effects upon African social organization can hardly be described adequately. The slave trade brought about a complete reversal of attitude on the part of Europeans towards Africans. Black people were read out of the human race. Their culture and history eradicated from European thought. Africa became the dark continent. To complete the destruction, in the 19th century, the scramble for Africa began. The European powers turned to Africa for new markets and colonies, and by 1900, they had completely with redrawn the African map 
with no regard for existing boundaries, societies, or political organizations. Colonial officers were sent in to set up governmental structures most acceptable to the European rulers. Industrialists use African labor for greatest possible profit for themselves. Further disruption came with the missionaries who demanded that Africans renounce their traditional beliefs and who introduced European-oriented education. As a result, there was little continuity between the school and the African child's social environment. Since the subject matter had little relevance to the child's life, he was not motivated to learn. So uh, ho ho hopefully for you, for you folks out there, not the ones here live with me now, but for you folks out there who's still on the fence about shit, you know, there's a saying that black folks don't hear nothing until the white folks say it. I've been saying this for the longest time. And others have said it, have said it before I was born. Let me repeat it. Since the subject matter had little relevance to the child's life, he was not motivated to learn. And yet we still do the same thing over and over and over. We send our children into, into a system that doesn't motivate them to learn. This accounted for the stress on rote memory, which characterized the education of African children. The, irre the irrelevancy of mathematics education is exemplified in the case of the Capelli children of Liberia. The schools are conducted in English, and the child must spend his first year at school merely learning the language. Outdated American books and methods are used. For example, the child is required to memorize the multiplication tables, but does not learn to apply this information to problems he encounters in everyday life. That's why our kids don't do well in the public school system. That's why we're constantly inundated with messages from the school that our child isn't performing this, that, because, because the shit doesn't really apply to their daily life. They don't see themselves in it. Gay and Cole tell the story of the student who was called upon to recite his tables. He began da, di da, di da, Da -di -da -di -da. The teacher interrupted to ask what he was saying. Chai replied that he knew the song, but had not yet learned the words. <laughs> that's a funny, that's a funny thing to say, right? We know the song, but we don't, we, we haven't learned the words. We do not know what technological progress with its accompanying mathematical growth, Africa might have achieved if it had been left free to develop, right? This echoes, this echoes how Europe under, underdeveloped Africa, right? No doubt the African peoples would have evolved their own transition to industrial society, retaining certain traditions and changing others as suited their peculiar needs, right? And that's a heavy, statement that's something that a lot of us don't really realize right so this brings us to a section called inadequacy of information but i see there was some motion in the chat room we have nikki ren who says in the film on youtube the great pyramid k 2019 they discuss how the Africans developed the metric system. So that's the name. So if I go on YouTube, Nikki Ren, I should look up the Great Pyramid K 2019. And I'll find that film. Uh, maybe that's something that I'll 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 stream in a in a live stream one day. All right. And by the way, Nikki Ren, you seem to be new. Have I, have I seen you here before? If you're new, I want to welcome you to the podcast, and I, and I would ask you to make sure that you subscribe to the show, hit the like button on this episode, 
check out other episodes that we've done if you haven't already and uh you know make sure click the bell to be notified when i'm on live or when i upload new content so in a in inadequacy of information my sources have for the most part been secondary ones the story is told by anthropologists, historians, linguists, missionaries, and colonial officers coming from the outside to see how Africans live and have lived. The influence of the dark continent mode of thinking is evident even in some of the sources used in this article. For example, the Manual of Foreign Languages by George F. Vaughn Osterman was originally published by the U.S. government printing office as an aid to writers and businessmen. The fourth edition was issued in 1952 with some revisions. In the introduction to the section on African languages, the author states, quote, African linguists will assist in spreading knowledge and civilization throughout the dark continent. Later, the Hottentot uh, language shows remarkable grammatical and phonetic development considering the low order of the mixed races Let's speak it. Ugh. Ugh. The author characterized Bantu counting as very primitive. The fact is, however, that stems for large numbers are common in the Bantu languages. The, the Bananda, a Bantu people of Uganda, had words for all multiples of 10 up to 20 million. Portuguese author Almeida wrote that the Bushmen Hottentots of South Africa were able to count only one, two, many. On the other hand, the black historian Dr. Woodson commented that Hottentots develop a complete system of counting on a decimal basis to keep track of their large herds of cattle. Uh, you know, and that goes without saying, you, you don't want to, you really don't want to ingest the history written about your people from outsiders. You really don't. And, and just as importantly, you, you don't want to allow them to have the opportunity to write your history. Nikki Ren says, I'm new and will do. All right, Nikki Ren, appreciate you. Uh, make sure to check us out and I, I i hardly ever mention this too but you could follow us also on social media on facebook instagram and twitter just look up the bitter medicine podcast or bitter meds and you should find us and and also follow kwaz radio's youtube channel i've been saying it for a while but some new things are going to start happening it just takes time for these things to to manifest but some new things will be happening on that channel as well with the development of the new African nations and the rise of native universities staffed by Africans, the history of Africa is being pieced together. As we learn more about the various cultures and their achievements, we will gain insight into their contributions to mathematics. So this brings us to the credits and the, uh, and the uh, references, right? Um, I just want to remind that we have someone new here today in Nikki Ren that uh, we do have a we do have a Discord server where we'll post a link. Nikki Ren, these episodes are based upon the idea, upon the project that we have as a podcast to create a new african-centered curriculum and we like to we like to have more african people people from all over the world all over the the diaspora right to lend their hand to this 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 effort if you listen to you know all of the recent episodes i've done i've i've especially the episodes where i'm reading african stories you'll see where i show how you can take the african story for the young learners and just take aspects of the story the animals they talk about or you know 
the, the, the morals or the geography or the peoples who the story come from in Africa. And you could spread that out into geography. You could spread that out into science, right? You could spread it out into English in terms of your writing prompts, uh, you know, history, social studies. So you can create a curriculum, right? Starting with your, with your young learners, right? That really reconnects um, our children to our African tradition. So as an African person, which I, which I imagine you are, I hope you are, um, I would hope that you would be willing to join and as you enter the Discord, just ask, how may I help, right? And we'll go from there. Um, because there's some simple stuff I need to do, but it's a lot of work for me to do it right now by myself. And that simple work is read some African myths and stories and write down the names of the animals, write down the names of the people, right? F figure out the, you know, what language they speak. What's, how do you count from one to 10 in the language? How do you say hello and goodbye and my name is, and you know, the simple, the, the rudimentary stuff that you do when you first begin to learn a language. And so that we can expose these children to different groups in Africa, not just one group or, or one language per se, but different groups, different languages. We open their minds to, to, to them being, you know, African people, right? I need people to jump on and start saying, hey, I'll take this part, I'll take that part, etc." right? So if that's you, by all means, please check us out. But again, I'd like to thank you for being here today, all right? So the credits of this paper says, it should, I should like to express my gratitude to the many people who took valuable time to reply to my inquiries with helpful information. Many others replied that they had no information. Besides those I have mentioned in this article, I owe a lot of debt to, and then she goes through and she mentions all the different resources she had. One of them, number six, came up in our reading was uh, Conversations in Yoruba and English. Uh, 16 also, right, a practical introduction to Mende. This is where the chief had written, uh, had written a book on, for foreigners and how, how to understand and communicate um, in his in his region right um but here's the thing i want to point out she says the author says i'm grateful to the librarians of the schomburg collection new york public library where i did much of my research again for you folks who live in New York, how often have you gone to the Schomburg? And I know it's up in Harlem, so you know, it is what it is, but how many of you have even visited once, sat in there, and did any you know, formal research in there? These folks are doing, this woman lives somewhere like upstate New York or, or you know, yeah, somewhere upstate New York, right? So it's just fascinating to see how these folks take their time and study us. And again, they capitalize off of us. She did another work that I'm uh, thinking about looking at, where she was looking at how Egypt has influenced, you know, all the math, right? And that, that, that may be something I look at in the future. But I hope you guys enjoyed this paper. That's the end of the paper. Um, again, if you're on the Discord and you would like this paper, just ask me for it. I'll give it to you. It's no big deal. Um, but we need to start doing our work. I want to thank you guys for being in the chat room once again. You guys make the show better when you're in the chat room. At least I feel better when you're in the chat room. I have people to fact check for me, people to correct me when I'm wrong, and people to give me, you know, a thumbs up for job well done whenever that happens. 
I want to thank you guys for listening. I'll be back again. As you know, my my uh, my schedule is Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday where this podcast is concerned. So I'll be back on Thursday. Okay? Until then, peace. Thanks for listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast with your host, Koku. If you like what you just heard, we hope you pass along our web address, bittermedicineblogs.com, to your friends and colleagues, and share our show to all your social media. Be sure to check out our archive section on our website for previous podcasts. This has been a KWAZ radio production. Join us next time for another session of the Bitter Medicine Podcast. Follow us on Facebook at Bitter Medicine Show, Twitter, Bitter Meds, Tumblr, Bitter Meds, Instagram, Bitter Medicine.